Hey there everybody, I'm Chili. Welcome back to 3D Fundamentals Tutorial 11. The circle is now complete. Or at least it will be when I'm done with this video because we are going to implement a Z buffer today and that is going to mostly solve all of our occlusion related woes. Now you might be saying, what occlusion woes? I don't have any occlusion woes. Well, take a look at this little demo here I've got for you. I'm rotating two cubes here in opposition to each other. Now the cubes are the same size. Watch when I try to uh, push one into the background. You would think at some point it would get occluded by the other cube, but that is not the case. It is always being drawn on top of it, even though it is clearly going behind it. Remember, these are both objects of the same size. Uh, so one is clearly behind the other, but we ain't seen that. People don't think it be like it is, but it do. Now, we already discussed this problem a little bit. Uh, if we just draw our triangles in any old order, shit that should be appearing behind is going to appear in front of other stuff and it's going to be messed up. Now, we sort of solved that problem for a convex shape like a cube by culling away all the triangles that are facing away from the camera. And therefore, we didn't have that problem because with a convex shape, the triangles that face the camera never overlap each other. But here you see, when we have multiple meshes in the same scene, that isn't going to help us, is it? And I mean, there are ways we could try to solve it. Again, we could use Painter's Algorithm, which is the idea you draw the furthest away thing, and then you draw the thing that's the next closest, and because it's closer, you can allow it to overlap the thing that was behind it, then you draw something that is even closer. So you'd have to sort all of your geometry. You could sort your models, but um, that wouldn't save you in the case of models with concave geometry. You could sort by triangle, and that would be better, but what if you have, you know, geometry with interpenetrating triangles like this? It's not gonna save your ass, you can't sort that shit. And besides, who wants to sort that shit anyways? That's, that sounds like a real pain in the ass. There must be a better way. And of course there is, it's called the motherfucking Z buffer or the depth buffer. And you should have guessed that from the title of this video. So now you're saying, chili fucking spit it out, tell me what the Z buffer is. Well, Z buffer is a simple, elegant, and performant solution to our problem. Basically, since sorting at the model level, sorting at the triangle level, isn't good enough, we're gonna go down to the finest grain level we can, the pixel level. So here are the basic steps of how the Z buffer works. So you know, we got our back buffer, which is a buffer of color values. It's a 2D array of pixel data for the image that we are drawing. It's our uh, render target. Uh, we're gonna create another buffer, we'll call it the Z buffer. It will also be a 2D array, and the dimensions are gonna be the same as the back buffer. Uh, but instead of storing color values, it is going to, each element is going to be a single floating point value, and that will be a depth value. Now, when we start to draw, we're gonna set all of these depth values to infinity, or at least the maximum value possible. Now, say we're rasterizing a triangle. Uh, whenever we draw a pixel to the screen, uh, we are going to draw its resulting depth value to the corresponding element in the uh, Z buffer. You know that for Z correct texturing, we have to interpolate Z across the entire uh, face of the triangle, so we have that Z value. And all we're gonna do is whenever we draw a pixel to the back buffer, we are going to write that Z value, which is the depth of that pixel, to the Z buffer. Now let's say we're trying to draw another triangle. This triangle is behind the first triangle. So we want to draw, let's start by trying to draw this pixel. Well, what Z buffering does is it doesn't only write the depth value to the depth buffer, it also checks before writing any pixel. So here, we are now going to try to draw this pixel of the triangle to the back buffer. So we have its Z value, we check it against the Z value that is already existing on the depth buffer. We find that it is greater 
because it's farther away, so it has a bigger Z uh, than the one that's already here. That means that we have already drawn a pixel that is in front of this pixel. So we should not draw this pixel. So we just reject it. We do not draw this pixel. We do not draw this pixel. We do not draw this pixel. We, we check them and we say, nope, uh, these guys can't draw them. And then we get to here and we see, oh, this one, this one is at currently at infinity. So infinity is obviously greater than whatever the fuck this is. So let us motherfucking draw this pixel. So we draw these guys here and maybe we draw these guys here. I don't know. I don't know how that's gonna look. Something like this, I don't know. But as you can see here, when we try to draw to a pixel on the back buffer, if the corresponding Z buffer value is less than this one, we discard. If it's greater than, then we draw. And here you can see why we clear the Z buffer to infinity or to the largest possible value. It's so that the first triangles that are drawn, it ensures that they will be, they will appear. The first time any pixel is drawn to, it's guaranteed not to fail the, uh, the depth test. And that's it, there, that's all there is to it. Uh, and you just use the interpolated Z value to update an array of the depth for each pixel and we use that as a kind of mask to decide whether or not a pixel will be drawn, whether it is behind something that was previously drawn or whether it is currently at the forefront. And this is actually a kind of sorting in its own way, um, but it's a special kind of sorting because with drawing, we're only really interested in the first thing in a sequence of pixels, the one that has the lowest depth, and we don't care about the order of anything behind that. So it's a special case of sorting, so we can treat it specially, we only have to keep track of the lowest value for any pixel, and that gives us a nice boost in performance compared to trying, if we had to try to sort every pixel by depth, it would be, it would be pretty fucking hard. But we only have to keep track of the, clo the current closest one. All right, now for the fun part, let's take a look at the code. Uh, looks like there were quite a few changes. Actually, there were very few. The main one is that we added a class called ZBuffer. And what is the ZBuffer? Well, it's basically just a wrapper around a 2D array. I'm not sure why I didn't use unique pointer for this, but whatever, you have to ask uh, previous Chili that. So we got a pointer that owns the buffer, we've got, uh, we store the, the width and the height, the dimensions of the buffer. And yeah, constructor, we construct new array here, destructor, delete, that's no problem there. Uh, clear, very simple, we loop over all the elements and we set them to infinity, no problem. Use uh, numeric limits there, very sexy. Uh, we got a couple of uh, functions to basically get references to the depth elements there. So the at and const overload of at. So if you only have a const reference to the Z buffer, you can still access only for read only here. And then we got a function here, test and set, which binds together the two operations of checking the Z buffer and also setting it if the value is less than the current value. So we get a reference to an element of the Z buffer. We test it. If the current value is less than that, we update and return true. Otherwise, we return false. And then this bool can be used by the pipeline to determine whether or not it should be writing a color value to the back buffer. The other major change is, of course, to the pipeline itself. We add the Z buffer here. Uh, we have to construct the Z buffer. We construct it with the same width and height as the back buffer, which is the graphics. Uh, now we have to add a function begin frame here, and this is going to be the begin frame. Of the pipeline is going to do all the stuff required at the beginning of the frame. Right now, all that is required is that we clear the Z buffer. So that will clear the Z buffer for us. And if we go down here, nothing else changed here. Uh, down in draw flat triangle, just change a little bit of the comment here because now draw flat triangle is also doing a depth culling. And here we do, we do the business. So what we do is, I mean, as before, we recover the Z value in object space and then we do the test and set. And only if this returns true, do we then recover all the other attributes 
and invoke the shader and draw the pixel. Otherwise, we can skip all this stuff. So this kind of Z testing, it can actually make our code faster. Uh, and this, this gives us a little bit of an unintuitive effect on how we might want to write our code. Because normally, when you think of drawing, uh, composing an image on the screen, you think of drawing back to front, right? That's how it was done back in the days of 2D sprites and tile maps. But with a 3D graphics pipeline like this, you actually want to draw front to back. You want to draw the things that are in front first, because then when you try to draw the things behind them, you're going to get a whole bunch of pixels that are rejected by the Z test, and you can skip all the shading stuff. So there's actually a pretty big incentive to, to sort your geometry so that you're drawing front to back. But the nice thing about this is because the Z buffer is taking care of all the occlusion for us, we don't have to do a perfect sort. We can just sort generally good to improve our performance, but the actual image won't depend on our sort order. Just an interesting little observation there. Uh, the other changes here are minor. Basically, there's only one change in every one of these scenes, and that is we've got to call pipeline begin frame uh, before we start to clear that Z buffer. Everything else is, uh, it happens automatically in draw, right? So we don't have to change anything in our scenes. We just got to add that begin frame call. And that's it. When you run this stuff, um, you're going to get some very nice occlusion. Check, check this out. This is pretty fucking sweet. Let's push her back now. You can see that is very nice occlusion at the pixel level. Fucking sweet, ain't it? I like it. And there you have it. That is your Z buffering all done. It's pretty, I think you will agree, it's pretty simple. Once you have those properly interpolated Z values, Z buffering is a breeze. Now let's talk about some uh, differences with hardware. In hardware, generally, you have more options for configuring the Z buffer. Um, you can use different depth comparison operations, not just the less than that we're using. You can also have a choice of formats. Uh, typically, you know, floating point 16-bit, 24-bit, 32-bit. One major difference between hardware and what we're doing is the hardware actually stores um, 1 over Z in the Z buffer. So it doesn't store Z, it stores 1 over Z, which is also fine as long as you're using the same kinds of Z values, it'll work out. But this does cause problems because now your Z is not going to be linear. NVIDIA's developer site has a nice article here on that effect there, the nonlinear Z. Um, so if you look at it here, these little tick marks sort of represent the, the Z precision uh, at that uh, depth value, the near and the, the far. And as you can see, you have a lot more precision here, a lot finer grained um, depth. In the near plane, in the far plane, you have a lot less depth precision. And that's just a function. It's because it, if you store one over Z, it's nonlinear, right? And there are reasons for why the hardware likes to store one over Z instead of storing Z. Basically, if you have a huge range of your near and far, like if your near is, you know, maybe 30 centimeters or whatever, a standard camera near plane, and your far is like tens of kilometers, you are going to have, you're going to still have problems today with your depth. You're going to have to use special techniques, uh, probably split it up into peels of depth and draw it in sections. It was a lot bigger issue back in the days when 16-bit depth was the norm. These days, for normal situations, normal game applications, it's probably not going to be an issue. And there are techniques to deal with these problems as well. Um, you can take a look at this article. I'll put a link to it in the wiki if you're interested, but we're not going to go into that deep, much detail on this kind of niche problem right now. We got bigger fish to fry. One last problem with depth is when you have translucent pixels. Uh, in that case, the pixel in front might not be fully occluding the pixels behind it, so you need to know more than just the depth of the first pixel. You need to know the order of all the translucent pixels that appear up until the first opaque one. This is a problem that plagues graphics engines and hardware even today, but it's a pretty advanced topic and we're not going to go into it in this series, I don't think. One last thing I just want to mention here quick is something related to the depth buffer called the stencil buffer. Uh, it's similar, it's also stored per pixel. It's often stored together with the depth buffer. And it's, ki it's kind of like a Z buffer, but it's more flexible. You can use it 
for rejecting pixels to do stuff like drawing user interface, a HUD, drawing portals, drawing mirrors, uh, shadow effects. You got more control customizing how values are written to the stencil buffer and how comparisons are made. Uh, so it's just a general purpose uh, buffer for doing stenciling effects. I may or may not go into it later on in this series, but if I don't, I'll definitely be looking into it in the hardware 3D series. But that's gonna about do it for this tutorial on the Z buffer. Now that we've gotten this Z buffering and this perspective correction stuff out of the way, all this housekeeping stuff, now we can really dig deep into shader stuff. And so the next video, we are gonna create the vertex shader and that is going to lead us into creating some dynamic lighting effects. So stay tuned for that good shit. In the meanwhile, thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please click the like button. It helps this series out a lot. And I will see you soon with some more 3D fundamentals.